Okay, everyone, this is Howard Mann speaking. I'm stepping in this week for Jeff Keeney. So, David and I have some cases to show. David, do you want to go ahead if I give you the screen share? Are you ready? It'll be fine. All right. Ready to go. Coming your way. Okay. Can people see a radiograph? Good. All right. This fellow is, um, is uh, feeling, feeling poorly here. He has a history of uh, myeloma, which is now in relapse. And the chest radiograph frontal view shows a vague blob up here and some abnormality up here. But the lateral view is more striking. You can see that there are all these uh, extra pulmonary lesions back here. And there's some pleural process back here and some blobs back here. And here's what his uh, CT reveals. He's got this extensive pleural process here with several lesions. And this one seems to be extending into chest wall. A lot of pleural disease back here and on the other side as well. So extensive pleural and then anterior mediastinal as well. We have this big blob in the anterior mediastinum here. And this is all plasma cytoma. Uh, this is part of his relapsed uh, myeloma here. He's got a particularly unfavorable mutation, which I uh, haven't written down. Um, and his, his uh, myeloma is in relapse, and we have this extensive extra osseous component of myeloma. There are bone, some bone lesions, too. There are these holes in the, in, in the spine that you can see in vertebral bodies. There is um, posterior element, some posterior element disease in one of these lower thoracic vertebral bodies I remember seeing. So he does have an osseous component, but he's got this very extensive extra osseous uh, relapse here. So he's about to get some additional therapy, probably some experimental therapy to try to wipe this out. But this is the most extensive extra osseous myeloma I've seen. And he's got this abdominal lesion too, medial to his left kidney. You can see this big lesion here. Um, so it's all evidently plasma cytoma in this guy. Uh, this is the most extensive extra osseous stuff I've ever seen. Look at uh, his pancreas and bowel. Is he maybe he's got more over there too? If you go, oh, something. I mean, there, oh, there are a lot. There are a lot of big blobs here that are yeah not like, not clearly gut. So yeah. he's got extensive, extensive disease, and you can see some of his skeletal lesions here with these punched out yeah uh, as well. Okay, yeah. so extraosseous myeloma. Uh, this is about the fifteenth case of that I've seen, and this is the most extensive. All right, here's one for just diaphragm fun here. This case came, came by this morning with the elevation of the right hemidiaphragm. And on lateral view, you can see that it's particularly steep elevation anteriorly and posteriorly. Posteriorly, it gets back down pretty far, but not all the way down to the level of the other side. When you see a very steep arc like this rather than a shallow arc, it really suggests that this is eventration rather than paralysis of the diaphragm. Paralysis usually results in a shallow arc that continues all the way back, much shallower than this. This is steep. And um, we have CT on him. Um, he's had this problem for a while. He's got colonic interposition here. And he's got not any atrophy of the cruse on this side of involvement, the right side, but actually hypertrophy of the cruse on both sides because of his abdominal obesity. So he has a BMI of about 35 or 36. And his diaphragm is actually working hard to enable him to breathe in against the resistance of, from all of this abdominal obesity that he has. And that's, I think, striking here on lateral view, the abdominal obesity, where you see you know, he's got this, this uh, subcutaneous fat, but he's got a lot of abdominal fat that's pushing his abdominal uh, um, wall forward. And another place to look for, to see if there's atrophy of the diaphragm that would suggest paralysis is besides the cruise posteriorly is to look anteriorly and here's anterior very good anterior muscle thicker than normal on on uh, both sides so he's got no no atrophy of his diaphragm to suggest paralysis indeed this is just a very big eventration of the right hemidiaphragm so checking out the cruise checking out the contour of the elevation are both helpful in identifying eventration 
Okay, so you can see that this is the thin area of diaphragm that, that's involved in the eventration. And then other parts of the diaphragm show normal muscle thickness, actually hypertrophy a little bit posteriorly here along the crus. And then on sagittal view, we saw, you could see good muscle thickness anteriorly as well. So eventration, not paralysis. Yeah, nice example. Okay, and then this person has this uh, radiograph at this point, which is the lungs are pretty clear, except there's some atelectasis or scar following a biopsy. We had an earlier chest radiograph on this person that showed really nicely clear lungs, pretty much a little bit of basal atelectasis, perhaps. But this person's CT scans had shown a lot of nodules. So let me show you um, lung nodules that are all over the place in this person. So lots of little lung nodules like this, um, both sides scattered around, quite a few of them, nodules, nodules, nodules. And then finally we got expiration views. We didn't have them originally and expiration shows a fair amount of uh, air trapping. So this is biopsy proved dip neck here. There was an open uh, a VATS um, lung biopsy on the right. That's the cause of the new atelectasis or scar. And this person has severe airflow obstruction. So FEV1 is markedly reduced. And um, there's some impairment of DLCO as well. So this person is actually being treated for the airflow obstruction. They're trying octreotide, but evidently there's not good evidence that there's effective therapy for uh, dip neck induced uh, airflow obstruction. And the pulmonologist was talking about there actually being constrictive bronchiolitis. I'm not sure that's the case. I thought, I thought that this condition was a um, potentially reversible constriction of small airways caused by the humoral factors produced by these carcinoid like tumorlets all over the place. But uh, he says that it's uh, actually a constrictive bronchiolitis. I'm going to look that up and see if that's um, a reason for there to be airflow obstruction. But severe airflow obstruction here, biopsy proved dip neck. So the combination of nodules plus air trapping are the classic findings of dip neck. Good, yeah, that's a very nice example. Okay, and then this woman has a, uh, presented with a pleural effusion in 2014, and she has a remote history of Hodgkin lymphoma treated in 2000 with chemotherapy, ABVD, and also then followed by total body radiation with a mantle boost to 48 gray. Um, and after that, she had, um, she had a, a, an autologous stem cell transplant as well, somewhere, somewhere in there. I think the total body radiation led up to the transplant. I think she might've gotten the boost later, the mantle boost, when she had a relapse. So that was all way back um, 14 years before. And now she has a pleural effusion on the right. And CT scan shows that she has pleural tumor here, floating in the, not floating, but attached to the edges here of the effusion. Here's another pleural mass. And if we come out along the mediastinum, we've got a mass here along the mediastinum as well. And then she has some atelectasis in that uh, lower lung, nice round atelectasis forming back there. Um, a few other little pleural blobs here and there. And this tumor was biopsied, and this was a um, mesothelioma. So this is uh, about the fifth or sixth case of radiation-induced mesothelioma that I've seen. Um, Hodgkin's radiation, uh, radiation for Hodgkin's disease accounts for several of these cases that I've seen in the past. So radiation-induced mesotheliomas should be a consideration. Asbestos is the, the famous thing that is a risk factor for mesothelioma, but radiation is as well. So I think she's a fairly young patient. She doesn't have a history of asbestos exposure, and this is presumably a radiation-induced mesothelioma. So she was treated with... Um, uh, Pembril, uh, lizumab, which is also known as Keytruda, and this is an anti-PD-1 uh, receptor uh, agent that's, in, that's designed to allow the T-cells to effectively attack tumor. She was 
treated with that for, for a while. She got some side effects, including uveitis and some skin lesions. It was withdrawn. Um, and uh, then it was reinstated at different times. I think she's now a candidate to have it reinstated another time. And her current symptomatology is um, something brand new. So she had a, she developed a painful and swollen uh, knee. Uh, she had MRI and it disclosed um, a big joint effusion. There was no, there was no bone lesion. The fluid was sampled. It had a lot of neutrophils in it. And this was presumed to be another manifestation of her pembrolizumab, pembrolizumab therapy with this sort of out of control uh, inflammatory system. When you, when you shut down your, the T cell regulation and stuff like that, then you can get these varying immunologic uh, effects around the body. And hers was a joint effusion attributed to her pembrolizumab. Lizumab therapy. He wanted to mispronounce it. Mispronounce it. Okay, so very interesting course here. Radiation for Hodgkin's disease, later mesothelioma, probably secondary to radiation, and then side effects of the therapy for her mesothelioma. So David, it's interesting. The the pleural tumors that you showed, quite unusual for mesothelioma, which is usually just continuous, very extensive lobulated thickening. These are quite right. one day. That's quite unusual. Yeah, but um, you know, sometimes mesothelioma is discrete blobs like that. Now, let me just show you that um, there's some documentation on the CT scan of her radiation as well. You can see this scarring in her apices here, scarring on the left, and similar scarring on the right. There were some later CT scans when she had less uh, pleural effusion that showed the radiation scar in the apices more clearly. So uh, we have radi radiographic documentation of the uh, radiotherapy as well as the historical documentation. Okay, I think those are the four cases. Uh, yeah, that's it. Great, thank you. Great. I'll just check to see if anyone else has signed on that may want to show cases. I don't think so. So I'll show a couple. Okay, no particular order. This one is interesting. Um, I wish I had remote radiographs to show you before this. But the history that I have is that this patient was treated with radiation therapy for lymphoma in the past. And certainly he's got a lot of opacity in his upper lung zones to go along with that. Let me just show you some of these. Some of these are MIPS images from the outside. Let me see if I can get down to some that are not like that. So here is May of 2017. I'll try and bring this out. I don't recall the sternotomy, the purpose of that, but you can see there's a subcutaneous port. There are um, apical lung opacities, you can see the hyla are pulled up, so certainly a lot of volume loss in the upper lung zones, and opacity is consistent with a history of presumably something like mantle radiation therapy. So that was quite a long time ago, and he came here because of a diagnosis of aspergillus. So if you begin to look up in these regions, particularly on this side, you can see there is a air crescent type of sign here with the rounded opacity. And as I'll show you in a moment, there is also some air in a cavity here. So it's bilateral, but these are present in the region of fibrosis. So let me see if I can bring up a CT from the outside to show you that. So here you can see the opacities and I actually want to show you a different one if I can from before. So here, if you look at this, you can see the opacities of radiation fibrosis. Uh, what's really interesting about this area up here is that it's a relatively low attenuation and there are small bubbles of gas apparently within that 
Now, when I go lower, you'll see how much of this is of low attenuation. And then there is a little bit of air above it. And then on this side, now I'll just go to the lung window. You can see there's a crescent of air around there. So if I go back again to this image, at least at the time this CT was done, there wasn't a crescent of air around the apical portion of what you see up here, but you can see there's something quite abnormal there, and here's some air right there. So just keep that in mind for a moment, and then I will show you the most recent CT from October, and it looks like, like that. So now you can see at the top of that, we have that crescent of air, and then air there, and then we see this kind of strange bird, bird's nest appearance on both sides left bigger than right. So on the left side, the space is mostly filled by this. And on the right side, there's a fair amount of air around this. So certainly this is consistent with the fungus spore. But you know, in thinking about aspergillus, there are various forms of aspergillus. There's the fungus spore that forms in a cavity, the cavity having been produced by another disease like tuberculosis or sarcoidosis. And then we have invasive aspergillus, and then we have ABPA. But the fourth kind of aspergillus that one can get is called chronic aspergillus infection or semi-invasive aspergillus, in which the aspergillus infects damaged lung. And one of the etiologies of the damaged lung is radiation fibrosis. So the idea is the aspergillus basically infects that portion of lung, it may produce lung necrosis, and then it may form its own cavity, and then you may end up with presumably a mycetoma in the cavity. So I think looking at this and knowing that he has damaged lung pretty extensively from radiation fibrosis, I think this is very likely that form of aspergillus, the so-called chronic semi-invasive, some people call it semi-invasive, aspergillus, that fourth sort of category of aspergillus infection. Have you seen cases like that, David? No, this seems to be a blend of um, mycetoma and invasive features here. So I was going to bring up is that first, when you first showed the picture, I thought this was a mycetoma in a pre-existing cavity. And I was going to point out that in that setting, the crescent of air should be called the monad sign rather than air crescent, because air crescent goes with evolving invasive aspergillosis. Right. And But then you confuse the hell out of me here by pointing out that this has features of um, mycetoma plus features of active invasive fungal infection or semi-invasive. Right. Yeah, in this coronal, you can see all these features really nicely. This is quite chronic. I think there's some mm -hmm. trophic calcifications that have formed there. But I started looking this up, and people have described the notion of the aspergillus, the semi-invasive form. The patient's not neutropenic and so on, just damaged lung. And sometimes it forms in patients with COPD, alcoholism, other things are blamed. And I don't think there's a causal association. I think that's random. But the aspergillus is an infection. It does destroy lung. It does cavitate lung, and then may remain there as a fungus ball in the cavity that it produced. That's sort of the idea. That's sort of the idea behind this so-called semi-invasive aspergillus as opposed to the invasive one we have in patients with neutropenia and so on. Very nice. So that's a, a very nice example. I'm, I'm pretty confident that's what it is. They have recovered aspergillus from this. So I think in terms of infection, I mean, in terms of treatment, I think this is a huge dilemma because you can't treat it very well. So it can become a very chronic problem, very difficult to treat, I guess, to get the antimicrobials to deal with this issue. So he's had that for quite some time. I'll just bring out the most recent chest radiograph again, just to show you. Here you can't see too much of air in that space, but you can see it here. And otherwise you can see findings of upper lobe fibrosis from radiation therapy. <coughs> Interesting. Huh? All right. This one is just a medical device for those of you that haven't seen this because 
I'm not sure that this is actually an FDA approved thing. So it was used in the context of at least a clinical trial. And I don't know if ultimately it was approved, but I almost never see this. So let me just bring this up for you. Patient with left with cardiomyopathy. I don't know if it's ischemic or not ischemic, but the finding is this appearance of this mesh around the heart. So if you just look over here, and then you can see the mesh appearance. Let me bring it on the lateral, bring it out to you a little bit better. So here you can see this very strange, sorry, mesh like appearance that really covers the entirety of the heart. And it has that appearance because this is what it looks like. So you can see they apply that to the entirety of a good portion of heart. And there's this idea that uh, somehow if you do some kind of remodeling of the heart, and I don't, I can't profess to understand the pathophysiology here and what it's meant to address, but somehow about restoring the, the shape of the heart um, between systole and diastole and some other theory behind why this cork cap device might work. It's a very strange thing, but I think I had it up here somewhere. So it's kind of looks like this. And it's basically seemingly just wrapped around the heart. I've seen it a few times. I don't know if anyone else has any comments about that. And there's some pathophysiology that I'll have to look at again, but I couldn't quite understand how it's supposed to improve cardiac function. It didn't make sense to me. Hmm. So it keeps the heart from stretching and getting even baggier and bigger. Is that the idea? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, supposed to, it's supposed to encourage some kind of remodeling phenomenon related to myocardium to reduce wall stress and some other things. And the more I read about it, the more mysterious. So, but I know we never see this anymore, so I don't think this has been successful. I think someone had a great idea and it only went so far. Or had an idea, it wasn't a great idea. And it only went so far, as far as I know. But it's a core cap device. All right, let's go to this one. So this is a case of interstitial lung disease. And I'm showing you this not because it's that super interesting or mysterious, but I'm going to just show you in the context of some new guidance relative to how we describe and approach the issue of so-called UIP, usual interstitial pneumonia of IPF. So in a patient like this, we'll all easily describe this as peripheral reticulation in the lungs. And we can see it involves the upper lung zones, goes down to the lower lung zones. I don't think I would describe this as really basal predominant disease distribution. It kind of appears mostly pretty diffuse, I think. There were a couple of areas like this. I just took a couple of images where I thought maybe, maybe at a stretch, there could be a little bit of subpleural bronchiolectasis in a place like that, for example. Going again to another place, maybe a few foci of traction bronchiolectasis. So we don't have any subpleural honeycombing. So what I want to show you now when you have this appearance is a relatively new, yet another one, and we've had many of these, but this is the most recent kind of guidance paper for the CT patterns of UIP of IPF. And this one is a Fleischner Society white paper. It was published in November of last year. And they have decided to yet again change the way we describe this. So they have the following categories, the typical UIP CT pattern. They have a probable pattern over here where one doesn't have to have honeycombing. Then they have one which is clearly inconsistent or not consistent with an IPF diagnosis. And then one here in the middle that is kind of in between these where you wouldn't say probable but the abnormalities were not so gross that you would say a non-IPF diagnosis, so kind of this indeterminate pattern. So in applying this schema to this particular case, 
I think by virtue of the fact that I think I see a little bit of subpleural traction bronchiolectasis, but no honeycombing, that this is a probable UIP CT pattern according to this relatively new schema. So the idea is that if the patient doesn't have any clinical features by virtue of age or occupational history or a history of a connective tissue disorder, if you have a typical UIP pattern or a probable UIP CT pattern, then you do not need to have a lung biopsy to diagnose UIP of, of IPF. So just another thing that that one has to learn. So I'm starting to report it this way just because this is the latest one and I don't know how many people report it this way, but just because I have it now, I just keep this on my computer and and I fit it into one of these categories in terms of reporting now, as you see here. Now, this is a case that I'm going to show you from uh, Julie from um, Washington, and she uh, shared this case with us. So this is a patient that I don't have information about the exact clinical condition, but apparently this cuffed tracheal tube has been like that for quite some time. The patient has been on a ventilator for quite some time, and ostensibly the tracheal cuff has looked like this for quite some time. So this is one image from September, and unfortunately this person experienced a complication of that, which is subsequent tracheal wall disruption with communication between trachea and esophagus, but also somehow the air also got into adjacent lung. So this is tracheal wall disruption perforation and here is esophagus. It seems to be, by my eye, quite a big gap there, this overinflated cuff. So a complication of, of that. There are other things that go here, which I presume is an aspiration syndrome or something else. I'm not quite sure what that is. I don't have more information. But this is just to point out that having a really big tracheal cuff for a long time is potentially harmful, as we see there. Oh, Howard, do you think it got it got <clears throat> it formed a tracheoesophageal fistula, and we got gas yeah. in the soft tissues Something along like as well. So somehow, definitely in involvement. Then I mean, sorry, esophageal involvement. Correct? Yeah, I think so. I believe so. Yeah, I mean, it's so abnormal up there. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but I think it somehow involved the lung. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it got infected and and exactly what's going on down here, except we can easily see that this is airway abnormality, extensive filling and, and distension of multiple generations of bronchi by material mm -hmm. and consolidation down here. So just an unfortunate complication of that. Okay, so this is a little bit more mundane, but let me, um, before I show you this, I just want to show you something else. So I've been having kind of an online discussion with some intensivists about the issue of ARDS and acute lung injury edema. And um, to try and make a long discussion relatively short, uh, this is a really interesting blog commentary by a really bright guy. I think he's a really bright guy on a particular website discussing the whole notion of ARDS and pseudo-ARDS and what's called he called the failure of the Berlin definition. So by way of background, when we diagnose a patient with ARDS, there are the so-called Berlin criteria, and you can see here that one component of it is the chest radiograph, but the other thing they rely upon are these measures of PaO2 compared to the inspired fraction of oxygen. And if you have these criteria and you're trying to make the clinical diagnosis of ARDS, these are the things that you look at. 
So he feels that a lot of patients that are labeled as having ARDS in general don't have ARDS, and he thinks there is a, what's well, a sort of paraphrasing, a relative epidemic of iatrogenic overhydration. So he has described pseudo-ARDS in various types just for purposes of discussion. And one that he thinks is quite prevalent is the pseudo-ARDS volume pattern. And there's another one that is the pseudo-ARDS um, atelectasis and effusion pattern. But if you look at what he says over here, he says, most cases of ARDS are probably due to volume overload, volume overload, volume overload, and then some other things. So he thinks that a lot of what is labeled as ARDS in intensive care units may actually be mostly overhydration lung edema rather than acute lung injury edema. So with that as a bit of background, let me show you this case. It's from our neurointensive care unit. So this is 1215. Person was intubated and admitted for seizures. So the background is neurointensive care seizures and airway and intubation for, I think, airway protection. So here we go now, two days later, and the person looks like that. And one day later, this person looks like that. And when I looked at the medical record, this person started to be labeled as having ARDS. So in trying to make a distinction between different things, here are a couple of things I think are notable here. So now I'm going to make this one big. So these are the changes from that previous radiograph that I showed you. We have a very distended azygous vein and the SVC is distended. So we have elevated CVP consistent with an expanded blood volume. We have pleural effusions. I think that if you were to interpret this whiteness as a lot of alveolar edema, I think that you would be overcalling that because even though there's a lot of opacity, one can still see pulmonary vessels here in aerated lung. I do see a peribronchial fluid cuff here or there, consistent with interstitial edema, but I think this opacity is because of the presence of pleural fluid. And then the other thing that is different from before is got a lot of chest wall, subcutaneous soft tissue edema. So if we put all those observations together, we get not acute lung injury edema, but findings very consistent with overhydration, hydrostatic lung edema. And as you'll see how going forward on the 19th, when they actually decided that he had enough pleural fluid to be significant, they put in pleural drains. Now you can see they drained a lot of pleural fluid. And then going forward one more day, here he is on the 19th, and here he is on the 20th. He'd never had acute lung injury edema. He didn't have ARDS. He had overhydration lung edema. So I see this all the time, and I'm showing you this one because it's a particularly nice case of overhydration edema and goes along, I think, with what that person was trying to say in that article, that a lot of what's potentially called ARDS is potentially, potentially just overhydration lung edema, fluid overload. And I think this is a nice case showing you that. Any comments, David, or just a nice case of that? You know, I think the, the abnormal chest radiograph that's on the right on your screen here shows that this basal predominance of the white stuff, which is good for edema. In this case, it's edema plus pleural effusions that are sliding up behind the lungs at the bases as well. So, you know, the real ARDS is often upper lung predominant, and this distribution suggests it is really good for edema with pleural effusion, given that it's basal predominant opacities here. So, yeah, um, I don't think I would, I mean, as a radiologist, I don't think I would call this ARDS just based on the chest radiograph here. It admittedly can be hard to make a distinction right. between what's in the lung and what's in the pleural space. But one thing that, I, that I'm swayed by is the uniformity of the opacity. And any time I see pulmonary vessels, in a sense, through the opacity of the pleural fluid, as it were, it tells me that these vessels here 
on embedded in aerated lung. This isn't just completely waterlogged lung. And that's one of the things that I look for when trying to make a distinction between what's in the pleural space and what's in the lung. Of course, sometimes it is really hard to do that. But they had labeled him with uh, ARDS for a time, uh, and he never had that. So I think he actually did okay. So this is, in a sense, iatrogenic. I don't know why they gave him so many fluids, why they overloaded him so much for seizures, but undoubtedly that's what they did. And he got better pretty quickly once they drained the fluid and he was able to aerate. Okay, I'll show you this one, which is kind of a nice radiograph and CT. So I'll just give you a moment to analyze this frontal projection of the chest. Yes, the person has in a pacemaker, but that's not presently an issue. This is just an observation kind of thing. Let me put up the lateral next door to it. It's got a scoliosis. His heart's a little bit big. And for those people that like anatomy like I do, um, I'll show you on the lateral projection that one observation has to do with this. And on the frontal projection, the observation has to do with when trying to find the aortic arch. Is it really here or is it actually here? So this over here is abnormal opacity in the retrotracheal space, radius triangle up here. So that indicates that he may have a retrotracheal vascular segment. And then perhaps his aorta isn't actually here, but it's maybe over there. So it turns out to be the case. So here on the CT, we see where his aortic arch is. We see where it descends, which is on the right side. And now we understand why the lateral projection shows what it does, because we're looking at this whole thing behind the trachea. And then, and David's really good at this, so if I if I make a mistake here, correct me. But when you see a vessel that comes off the aorta like that and courses fairly horizontally across from the right to the left, like that, sorry. And then when we go up here, we see a four vessel sign. One should think of a double aortic arch. And then here we have findings of a double aortic arch and probably an atratic segment between carotid and subclavian. Right, David? I think so, yes. Nice example. So you have a vascular ring here, and you can see it's crowding the trachea. Yeah. So just an incidental finding now. Double aortic arch, he's, he's an older person, of course. So they certainly, mm -hmm. one can have a double aortic arch with a ring, but never produce symptoms during life and live to be a good old age with that. So he's about, he's uh, 79. He just happens to have a, a double aortic arch. And these things can become symptomatic later in life because, you know, as the vessels expand with atherosclerosis and just, just aging and stuff like that, they become, uh, you know, more of a ring and they can have more of an effect on trachea and esophagus with time as they become tortuous and dilated. Yeah, his admission was not for any kind of pulmonary problem. I think it might have been for a stroke. I can't remember for sure. Cool. All right. I think those are my cases. So we saw a bunch of good stuff today. And let's adjourn. Thanks, Howard. All right. Thanks, everyone. And we will... Someone asked the question, is this not a diverticulum of Comoral? Let's see. Uh, not if I think so. Double arch. Double arch, yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you. Next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.